On your Thursday episode of Locked On Raptors, are you the kind of person who thinks the Toronto Raptors need to soothe their issues with guard depth this offseason? Well, fear not, because at the top of this draft, there just might be a topical ointment for that. I'm sorry. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? And welcome to another episode of Locked On Raptors, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Thursday, May the 2nd, and I'm your host, Sean Woodley. I've been covering the Toronto Raptors now for 10 seasons on various platforms. You can find all my work over on the Hell website at Woodley Sean. You can find the show on Instagram at Locked On Raptors. And of course, you can join us over in the Locked On Raptors Discord server, a wonderful place to come and hang out to talk about the playoffs, to talk about the draft, to talk about anything to do with basketball, the Toronto Raptors, food, video games. It's all in there. It's a great little listener community we got building around the show. We'd love to see you in there. If you're a sicko who loves this podcast, you'll be among sickos. If you just go to the link in the description of the podcast, it's free to join. We'd love to see you join us over there. Of course, you can find the show for free wherever you get your podcasts on the audio side of things. Follow, subscribe, rate, review, tell a friend. Word of mouth is always very good for spreading the good word about podcast still uh, and you can go find us on youtube as well you can go subscribe to the locked on raptors youtube channel hit the subscribe button hit the notification bell you get a heads up every single time the show is about to premiere so you never miss a second of the show you get it right as it's there and available right away and you get to hang out in the live chat with little sickos as well there's sickos everywhere lots of ways to engage with the sickos who like the podcast we love the sickos the sickos are what make the whole world Go around, at least the Locked On Raptors world, that is. Uh, today's show is brought to you by Monopoly Go, the fast-paced game that lets you team up with your friends uh, for tournaments and un- unlock uh, awesome prizes, unique stickers for trading, cool playing pieces, and hilarious emojis for taunting your friends. So download Monopoly Go for free on the Google Play Store or the App Store. Game on. All right. On today's show, we are continuing a draft talk. Uh, look at me. Me, the guy who is the draft skeptic, who doesn't like the draft, who thinks it's so very voodoo based and not, you know, there's some skill to it, but a lot of luck. I have uh, thrown myself fully into draft coverage and I'm having kind of a decent time with it, even with this draft class uh, not being all that great. And so we continue that today while we continue to fantasize about the Toronto Raptors having a top six pick, which is a thing that could happen at least for 10 more days until the draft lottery on May the 12th. We're going to talk about the guys near the top of the draft lottery whilst we can. And so today we spent a lot of time talking about the wing options in this range of the draft. We talked about Alex Saar and him as a potential number one if the Raptors move up in the draft. Today we're going to talk about guards, who who I think most people who cover and watch and on look the team have maybe been a little bit you know, sort of unenthused by the idea of taking a guard if the Raptors do, in fact, keep their pick. I know I have been very much on the side of just take as many wings in this draft as you can to help augment the roster the Raptors already have in place. Um, Obviously, Emmanuel quickly is the guard of the future on this team. There is very little question about that. He's going to get paid this summer by the Raptors. And so the idea of taking a guard with a very high pick, I don't think is like maybe top of most people's lists of things they'd like to see the Raptors do. And I think that applies to me. That's not the number one thing I'd like to see the Raptors do with that pick. Again, I want wings, baby. But there are some guards at the top of this draft who just might be interesting enough to take a swing on. And we know from Masai Ujiri's end of season press conference that addressing the backup guard spot is something that this team wants to do this summer. Uh, Obviously, there are different ways to do that. You can trade for someone. You can sign someone into your mid-level exception as a tidy backup If they go the cap space route, maybe they throw some money over at a Tyus Jones, for example, if they really want to kind of shop at the top of the backup market. Obviously, Tyus Jones figures to be maybe a starter somewhere, although I don't know. Is Tyus Jones a starter somewhere? This is a conversation for another day, but like he was the starter on the Wizards. I'm not sure a lot of teams are out there looking to upgrade their own point guard with the starting point guard on the Wizards. And I do kind of wonder... If Tyus Jones is maybe in that Dennis Schroeder tier where he is best served as one of the two or three best backups in the NBA and not like the 27th best starter, but uh, we can talk about Tyus Jones another day. We'll talk about other guards now. 
On today's show, we're going to dig into a, a trio of guards who are all projected to go in the top 10, some as high as number one in some cases. Uh, we're going to talk about Nikola Topic out of Serbia, and then we're going to talk about the two Kentucky guys, Rob Dillingham and Reed Shepard, coming up a little later on. But I want to start off with Nikola Topic because I, I think of the three that we're going to talk about today, he's the one that would make the most sense for the Raptors to take in the top six if they keep their pick. You know, let's say they get the sixth overall pick. They don't drop down. The teams that win the lottery are above them in the lottery. And so there's no movement from where the Raptors are. You know, if the wings are off the board, if Ron Holland's not there, if Zachary Risache is not there, if Alex Sar is not there, and you're not like a big Matas Buzelis guy, which I don't think I'm a big Matas Buzelis guy at this point, there's an argument to just say, hey, Let's just take the most skilled guy we can take here and figure it out later. This team is not in a, you know, at the peak of its competitive window or anything like that. While I would love for them to take ready-made guys who can contribute and have like obvious roles within the team that currently exists with the Raptors. That's why I'm so keen on the wings. You know, I think there's an argument for just going for skill and figuring out the rest later. And I think Nicole, Nicola Topic really offers that. He's also big. Uh, he's a 6'6 guard. He's one of the youngest guys coming out of this draft as well. He's still 18. Uh, he's the defending MVP of the U18 Worlds. That's not nothing. That feels like a thing to note. Uh, again, 6'6. Six, 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 he's got a 7-foot wingspan as well uh, and played mostly this season on loan from his club in Serbia at Mega Basket, another Serbian club uh, that turns out a lot of NBA players. You know, Think of like Timothy Lilwawu Kabaro, for example, is a recent draft of there. What, what a pull that was. Uh, I just remember doing a lot of scouting of that guy back in the 2016 draft. Anyway, uh, <laughs> many other uh, you know Serbian guys and other European players have come through mega basket over the years did the team with the cool pink and green jerseys if you're confused um during his time on loan with them this season not a huge sample just 12 games playing for mega basket across multiple competitions 18 4 and 7 for topic uh 67 shooting on twos which is the big ticket item with him he is a rim pressure merchant he just gets downhill gets into the paint and either scores or sprays pretty ridiculous kickout passes, dump off passes, all sorts of, you know, live dribble looks to guys uh, using his paint touches as a vehicle to create offense elsewhere and keep the offense humming. That's pretty interesting. Rim pressure is nice. The Toronto Raptors, I think, fancy themselves a rim pressure team. Jakob Pertl scores the rim with the best of them. Scotty Barnes, you know, obviously he kind of works in that sort of push shot floatery era, area a lot, but he gets downhill and scores at the rim a ton. Emmanuel quickly gets to the rim a ton, finishes less often, but we know that he's trying to get pain touches anytime he drives and got a lot better at that as the season progressed, as he stopped picking up his dribble so early and just kind of got into the teeth of the defense, made stuff happen. And we know RJ Barrett missed exactly zero shots at the rim after becoming a Toronto Raptors this season. So if you want to kind of like double down on your strengths, get, you know, more guys who fit into the things that the team wants to do. Nicola Topic certainly could help with that. Um, you know, the live dribble stuff with him as a passer is, is really fascinating when you watch the tape. Like, it, you know, sort of the stuff we saw that made us go, woo, with RJ Barrett a few times this year. That's like every time Nikola Topic gets downhill. If he's not getting to the rim and scoring, he's throwing pretty cool, like over the shoulder, offhand, skip passes, stuff like that. It's pretty cool. Um, the big thing with Topic is the shooting and it's, you know, look, shooting's tough to figure out with anybody and, and sort of the indicators can be all over the place. The one thing that to note with the three point shooting for Topic is yes, he was sub 25% from three this season across his multiple teams. He played, he played like four games for his club in Serbia, uh, Zervania Zvezda. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that horribly incorrectly um but either way you know he, he shot 25 percent or, or just below 25 percent from deep when you look at his jump shot i don't love the look of the jump shot again i'm not a shot doctor or anything like that um but he's got a bit of a low release as someone who has a low release who gets his three-pointer blocked a lot at men's league i think i know a thing or two about low releases <laughs> not to say that uh, i'm anywhere near the the level of a nicola Topic or anyone else who plays basketball professionally but like a low release is tough to deal with it's a bit of a flat looking jumper there's not a ton of arc to it it's like the anti friend van elite when it comes to the arc on the jumper um and so i don't think it's like a, a you know a guarantee that he just goes and becomes a three-point shooter that said, 87% at the line is really nice and indicates a lot of touch. And so that, I, I think, is a, is a pretty fascinating thing to see, you know, if that can be the thing that portends better three-point shooting. 
But it's not just a lack of three-point shooting for Topic. Like, pretty low volume, not super high efficiency, obviously. But he's also kind of not got much of an in-between game. Like, it's very much he's getting to the rim and trying to score or he's passing out of that. There's not a whole lot of, like, a floater game or a mid-range pull-up game or anything like that. Kind of a one-level score, I would classify it as right now, based on what I've seen. Um, and, and a thing, too, that's interesting to note as well that makes it hard to fully evaluate Topic. And I, I pulled this from uh, Hoop Intellect, Keandre on YouTube, a future guest of this podcast. We're going to get him on, hopefully, after the draft lottery. Just a fantastic scout on YouTube, breaking down these guys' strengths, weaknesses, improvement areas, comps, etc. Go check out Hoop Intellect. It's a big source of a lot of my draft research. Um, but he notes that we don't know a ton yet about Nikola Topic's defense because of what Mega Basket asked him to do. Like there was there was a ton of just like automatic switching in that scheme, um, you know, rarely guarding opposing teams' best players, not asked to stick through screens and fight over screens. So we don't really know sort of what he is as like a screen navigator because he just wasn't asked to do that very much when he played this season. And other teams didn't often try to pick at him, which I suppose you could look at as a good thing. Like, oh, like he's not being, you know, pinpointed and targeted. But it's also European basketball where I think the sort of mismatch hunting style of play is just less prevalent. We, we've seen it, you know, permeate in the NBA as well, right? Like, uh, I think there's lots of teams that kind of uh, avoid the mismatch thing. The Raptors this past season under Darko, for example, being one of those teams where, yeah, sometimes you got to go find one in the playoffs. Absolutely, you do. But for the most part, like, you know, you're not sort of going and pinpointing exact matchups every single time down the floor. So that's a bit of a blind spot when it comes to top of just defense. But he is 6'6". He's seven feet tall. He got the seven foot wingspan. Sorry. Like there's some size to work with there at his position. I think you could play him in lineups with Emmanuel quickly and feel pretty all right. It could kind of unlock quickly's off ball juice. Um, it's the fit with Scotty Barnes. I'm a little less sure of because having two heavy ball handlers in your starting five, you know, in theory, again, we're talking about guys who are probably going to be bench players to start. But if you're drafting someone in the top six, the idea hopefully is that they become a starter for you someday. And I do wonder about the lack of shooting from Topic, the unsure shooting with Scotty Barnes. Both guys need to be on the ball to be at their best. Although Scotty's obviously got a lot of off-ball juice as well, attacking closeouts, the catch-and-shoot threes when they were falling. It was a massive boon to his game. Um, but I do wonder about the overlap between those two guys, and, and can you really coexist with two iffy shooters who like to have the ball in their hands and create? I, I think that is probably where I decide top is maybe not for me and if the raptors in the position where he's just the guy at six there and you're not in love with anyone else once again we'll dial back the trade back machine which is a thing i really think the raptors should be considering if they keep this top six pick because i have yet to be blown away impressed by any guy in the top six outside of maybe alex sar and even then it's not like a, a no doubt can't miss package of skills and so Topic, interesting. I wouldn't be mad necessarily he's taken there because he's a fun, interesting player. He's got some great downhill juice. But overall, the lack of really a full picture of his defense, and they need defense on this team so badly, especially at the point of attack. Uh, the lack of size to kind of elongate the Raptors, push RJ Barrett to the two, like we've talked about being, I think, a pretty high priority long term. Um, you know, I, I don't know if Topic is the right guy, but if it's, you know, he's the only guy there and all the wings you like are gone then maybe you just do it. But again, trading back feels like the move to me. And Topic, it just it doesn't quite feel like perfect, perfect enough fit for me to really feel good about that pick if it is uh, going to be at number six, and especially even higher than that. Even though some people like Ricky O'Donnell has him number one on his board uh, in his most recent mock draft from early April. Um, you know, the Ringers got him number four. Like, there's a lot of skill here. You could do worse with him at six for sure. If there's no trade back option, you just do it. But um, not my favorite pick here. But I think probably... Of the three guys we're going to talk about today, the one I'd be happiest with the Raptors taking in the top six, no doubt. We'll come back on the other side, talk about a guy who uh, is just a bucket getter. And if you like hoopers, man, oh man, is this guy going to be for you? We're going to talk about Rob Dillingham from Kentucky coming up in just one sec. Today's show is brought to you by Game Time. It's an authorized ticket marketplace of the NBA, which makes getting playoff tickets, sorry Raptors fans, even faster and easier. Prices on Game Time actually go down the closer it gets to tip off. So maybe you're traveling, maybe you're on the road and you want to go catch yourself a game while you're in town. Uh, maybe you want to take the drive down to Boston or something like that to catch a playoff game. 
all sorts of options there. And Game Time will be the place where you want to go and buy those tickets. I've used Game Time a ton. I, I love using Game Time. It's uh, it, it just really saves you a ton of money. It really is that it. The story I like to tell is that you know I was standing outside Climate Pledge Arena in Seattle over the summer while I was on vacation with my wife. And we decided, hey, let's just go to the, the Storm game that's on this afternoon. We pulled up Game Time, bought tickets for like six bucks in the lower bowl. And we hopped right in like from where we bought our tickets was like an eight step walk into the arena. It was beautiful and game time made it. So we paid a super duper low price because we bought it right before game time. Again, game time. It's all in the name. As they get closer to game time, the prices are going to go down at the lowest price guarantee. Game time will credit you 110% of the difference if you find lower price tickets somewhere else. Uh, they've got ticket coverage as well. Uh, one of the most flexible customer service policies in the ticketing industry. It's all there for you. Go check out Game Time right now. Download the Game Time app. Create an account. Use the code Locked at NBA for twenty bucks off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account. Redeem the code Locked on NBA. Spelled out L O C K E D O N N B A for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, back at it here on your Thursday episode of Locked on Raptors. Just a heads up, this was going to be a double episode day, but I'm actually going to push that to Friday. We'll have a pair of draft-themed episodes tomorrow. Uh, we're going to look at some of the other wings that might be there at six for the Raptors. Dalton Connect, Jacoby Walter, and uh, Cody Williams on tomorrow's early morning podcast. And then later in the day, uh, maybe I'll drop it Saturday, depending on the time. I don't want to be too close to one another. But either way, you're going to get two episodes between tomorrow and Saturday, no doubt. Uh, and the Saturday episode, we're going to talk about some of my favorite wings lower down in the draft. Jameer Watkins, Jalen Tyson, Johnny Furphy. Uh, that's probably going to be the trio we take a look at as we examine the wing pool. Those guys will be there surely, or, or some of them will be at 19 for the Raptors, which uh, it's a big, big pick, especially if the Raptors don't keep this top six pick. However, if they do keep the top six pick, another guy who will likely be there, maybe he goes higher, but there's a chance he's there for the Raptors at six, is 6'3 guard Rob Dillingham out of Kentucky. Um, 6'3", 176 pounds, a very slight man, 6'5", wingspan. Um, and to me, just watching his tape, a pretty damn thrilling offensive player to watch. Like, of all the guys mocked in the top 10, feels like he has the highest offensive upside of basically anybody. Um, like, the dude, like I said, bucket getter, a hooper's hooper, and he put up some pretty impressive numbers this season at Kentucky coming off the bench for all but one game 15.2 points a game 2.69 boards uh sorry 2.9 boards 3.9 uh, assists on 47 percent from the field 44 percent from deep nearly 80 percent from the line as well again came off the bench for all but one game for Kentucky this year I think based on what I've seen so far and there are guys I still got to watch there's no way that anyone in this draft has a better handle than Rob Dillingham. It is nasty. He's got a million different crossover moves. Um, really incredible with his feet in traffic as well. Great footwork to kind of dodge bigger players and sort of navigate the trees as it were. Um, the, the handle, getting to the rim, it's all really, really impressive with Rob Dillingham. Like He just puts the ball on a string and he plays with like a real brazenness too. Where it's just like, yeah, I know you can't contain my handle. Try and stop me. It's kind of like what it feels like the energy is that's exuding from him as he's handling the ball, bringing it up the floor. Um, I think it's the best handle of anyone in this draft that I've seen, at least. And people can disagree because uh, they're smarter than me, but that's fine. Um, you know, around the rim, didn't shoot super well at the rim this season, just 53% at the rim this year. But there's a lot in terms of craft and touch and a whole bag of moves that he goes to to try to finish. He's got a floater game. He's got all these sort of different scoops and up and unders. Uh, he's got fun reverses. He's got this like soaring hook that he'll come in with to kind of throw it over the head of a bigger guy who's trying to contest his shot. Um, really, really just like a ton of craft from Dillingham around the rim. Um, again, he's not finishing super well there, but that feels like something that can come along as he gets stronger. You would hope the limit is like, how strong is he ever going to get? Cause he is six, three, one seventy six. Like he's always going to be small. Your height is your height. You can't do much to contend with that, especially in the NBA as size becomes more of a premium across the board. But the, the thrilling scoring flashes he has like, 
it's tough to replicate, man. It's hard to find guys who score with that level of confidence, that level of precision and efficiency. Um, he, he's certainly fascinating if you really feel like you, your team needs like a big jolt of offensive energy. Um, Raptors wise, I think the fit's interesting, right? Like I, I think, you know, you're probably never going to want to see him running in two guard lineups with Emmanuel quickly, just way too small and probably too samey in terms of skill sets uh, to really make it work. But as like a backup sort of head of your bench type guy, kind of interesting to think about him sort of guiding the offense for a second unit feels like the type of guy who can ensure a second unit never has those four five, six minute lulls without any scoring production from a second unit things that we've seen uh, on repeat for the Toronto Raptors over many, many years with various different iterations of teams and coaches and personnel, et cetera. Um, Dillingham feels like a true off the bench microwave scorer dude uh, who's going to put up buckets and, and keep your offense afloat. Um, you know, when it comes to his off ball work, like there's actually some interesting stuff there too. It's not just a guy who needs the ball in his hands, um, as a catch and shoot three point shooter shot 48% per hoop intellect, um, 1.42 points per possession on catch and shoot threes this season. Uh, you know, that would play beautifully off of Scotty Barnes, off of Yaka Pertle. You could run him through a lot of the same stuff that they run for quickly. Say you want to have quickly sort of be your first sub out and run with the bench. You could bring in Dillingham, run a lot of the same stuff have that stylistic unit to unit consistency. That's interesting. That's fun. Um, and he can carve up a closeout too, because he's got that great handle, that quick first step. If it swings to him on the other side of, of, of a defense, like you get to the weak side, um, you know, he's going to be able to really punish a tilted defense. That's trying to overcompensate and get back into position. Very similar first step and kind of get downhill uh, elements that like Norm Powell had, although a lot more, craft and deftness and touch um and a better handle probably less dunking than norm powell did in those situations but uh there's something interesting there the biggest question with rob dillingham is defense and that is just like i don't know how he's ever remotely good on defense he like you watch the tape some pretty baffling stuff you remember at the start of this season when dennis schroeder forgot how to play defense came in as this like pesky point of attack wizard and he just like forgot as his responsibility as an offense kind of took up too much space uh and he was just getting left behind every screen was catching him he was losing the hip of his man constantly and never finding it um rob dillingham when he's guarding a guy and someone screens him he loses the hip of his man forever a lost sunken treasure that he's never getting back to uh, really re kind of disappointing when you watch him and his like recovery, um, you know, after being taken out of the play, there's not much of a second effort there. Um, something that Hoop Intellect really noted on in his video, breaking down Dillingham's game. And I just like, I don't know what you do with someone who's that slight, who doesn't really slide his feet super well to stay in front of guys who gets lost on plays, especially when you envision him, like the Raptors would probably use him early on in his career. If they were to take him in lineups with Kelly Olynyk. Grady Dick, like that just is so much in terms of you know porous perimeter defense, rim protection, like those second units, as much as Rob Dillingham could keep him afloat offensively, the the whole sort of trade-off of his entire the whole whole idea of him as a basketball player is can he be good enough on offense to make the defense passable? And in second units with other bad defenders, I have real questions over whether that would actually be the case. Um and, and like is Yaka Pertle, Scotty Barnes a good enough backline to protect him? I'm not so sure. Like, you put him on the magic with their hordes of ridiculous long defenders and Jalen Suggs to take on the biggest assignments. 100% perfect fit. Would love to see Dillingham on that team. Um, the Spurs, you want to have him be the guard, you know, who, you know, has Victor Wembanyama as his backstop? A thousand percent could be tons of fun. You could probably get by with it there. But without like elite, elite, elite defense behind him, I think his lack of really any resistance at the point of attack probably causes a lot of problems. And it's just like a cascading effect when you have that bad perimeter defense. We've seen it happen to the Raptors. Their perimeter defense the last couple seasons has not been very good. And it leads to all kinds of problems. You're constantly just kind of cleaning up messes. It's whack-a-mole when that happens, that there's no resistance at the point of attack. And so um, that, to me, the defense for Dillingham is kind of the biggest reason why I wouldn't take him as the, with the Raptors. You know, the fit stuff, the overlap with quickly is another thing. Um, but I think if you're taking Dillingham, 
you probably have to be pretty reasonable about your expectations for him. And I think it's most likely he ends up being like a perennial sixth man, you know, of the year type guy, um, the sort of classic Jamal Crawford, Lou Williams, you know, spirit of the gunner type guy, um, which is, you know, it's fine player to have. But in the top six, when this team badly needs help on the wings, they need size, they need defense. I think it'd be a pretty erroneous decision to make that call. A a a erroneous, egregious. I always confuse those words because I'm bad at English. Uh, I think it'd be a pretty egregious call to say, hey, we're using this prime pick on a guy who does not at all help our defense, helps the offense maybe a little bit, although I'm not even that worried about what the offense is going to be at full health um, and, and just has a little bit too much overlap with the guy who we know is going to be the guard of our future. Totally could turn out that he ends up being you know, passable enough on defense with the right team around him to be kind of a fringe all-star type guy, but I, I just don't know if the defense is ever going to be there to kind of make him a guy who you trust playing in clutch moments of a big game or in the playoffs, for example, like that feels like where his utility kind of wears out. Think about Lou Williams back in the 2014, 15 season, right? Really excellent all season long playoffs come around the free throws dry up the sort of ridiculous logo shot making dries up. And all of a sudden Lou Williams is unplayable in that series and the Raptors get swept. And he was a really big part of that team. I think that's my big fear with Dillingham. And so as fun as he is, as electric as he is, as much as I'll enjoy him you know, watching him cook, uh, I, I think the defense and the size probably make it so. I'd be pretty disappointed if the Raptors took him with a top six pick. We'll come back on the other side. We'll round it out with Reed Shepard, uh, another Kentucky guard who is somehow smaller, at least dimensions wise, than Rob Dillingham. Uh, maybe offers a little bit more on defense, but is it enough? We'll get to that coming up in just one sec. Today's show is brought to you by our deal friend, dear friends over at Monopoly Go. Uh, look, I've told you, I love Monopoly. It's a great game. Uh, the classic board game, one of my absolute favorites growing up. Rainy days, all that stuff. Uh, in my adulthood, still like to play it when people will play it with me. But as I've said uh, before, uh, when I've talked about Monopoly Go, my lovely in-laws and my wife, uh, who love playing board games with me normally, don't like playing Monopoly with me at all because I get really intense about it. Uh, and we have made it so we only play once every four years on February the 29th, every four years on the leap day. And so in the meantime, I need Monopoly Go to scratch that Monopoly itch. In Monopoly Go, you can team up with friends for time tournaments where you work together to build up each other's boards. The more you win together, the more awesome your prizes uh, are that you unlock. And there's so much to get. Unique stickers you can trade with friends to complete albums for big prizes, cool new playing pieces with travel boards um, or to travel boards with. You got hilarious emojis for taunting friends when you smash their buildings and heist their vaults. Yes, you can heist your friends' vaults. That's super fun. There's always new timed events to help you win big, like massive multipliers for everything you win or rent frenzies. There's always something fun to discover in Monopoly Go. So get off the bench and go download, go download it for free on Google Play or the App Store. Game on. All right, wrapping up the show here, looking at guards who just might be there if the Toronto Raptors keep their pick in the top six. Once again, we will know about that pick in 10 days on lottery day, a refresher, 46% chance the Raptors keep their pick in the top six, 37% chance they move up into the top four, and a 54% chance they lose their pick and convey it to the Spurs, which sounds disastrous, but it's fine. It would be fine. We'll talk about why it's fine, I'm sure, over the next couple of weeks as we get closer to the lottery. But uh, either way, let's operate like they're going to pick top six for now while we can and continue to talk about the guards who might be there in the top six for the Raptors. The last guy we're going to talk about today, Rob Dillingham's teammate at Kentucky, Reed Shepard. 6'3 guard with a 6'3 wingspan. Yes, even wingspan for a 6'3 guy. Little, little, little concerning, I would say. He shot... 52.6% from deep in 2023-24. That is the pitch for Reed Shepard. Absolute dead-eye knockdown shooter. Averaged 12 and a half a game this year for Kentucky. 4.1 boards, 4.5 assists with two and a half steals a game as well. We'll get to the defense. Um, but obviously the three-point shooting, that's the big ticket item here. Um, is he going to shoot 52.6% from deep in the pros? Probably not, but uh, really, really high end uh, three point shooting certainly on the table for him. The shot looks pretty. Um, he can do it in all sorts of different ways off movement, uh, you know, pull ups, things like that. He's uh, he's very interesting as a shooter, at least. Um, you know, beyond that, nah, I, 
I think a lot of people like Reed, Reed Shepard. I'm probably not super thrilled about a lot of the stuff he brings. Like, yes, there's some fun stuff on offense. Um, he's pretty good at kickout passes. Not so great at finishing at the rim just yet. Um, gets there a little bit. Gets to those paint touches. A pretty decent kickout guy. Um, really, really good transition passer and outlet passer. And to go back to what I talked about off the top with Nikola Topic, you know, the kind of idea of doubling down on the things you do well, getting to the rim being one of them. The other thing this team does really well is they run with the best of them. They were the best transition team in basketball by basically every metric this year. They are nasty when they get it on the run. Scotty Barnes, obviously a huge orchestrator of that. RJ Barrett became a really awesome transition weapon. Just this complete battering ram of a dude running 94 feet and scoring um, quickly, obviously offers the speed getting to the rim in transition and also the, the sort of three point shooting on the flanks. That's really fun. Really interesting transition attack the Raptors are going to have going forward here. Anytime Scotty Barnes is on your team, you're going to be a good transition team. And Reed Shepard would just compound all that makes this team good in transition. The outlet passes, the finishing on the run, um, you know, the kind of fill in lanes, things like that. Uh, a really, really nice transition player. And so, you know, that could certainly be interesting to, to slot him in. The thing that is going to be, again, a determining factor here is how real is the defense for him? Really incredible counting stats on defense in college. He was like 0.7 blocks a game, two and a half steals a game. Um, just kind of all over the place as like a defensive event creator. But is that enough in the NBA? When you're six foot three with a six three wingspan, like I said with Dillingham, your size is your size. And in the NBA, if you're not big, you have a lot to overcome. And, and I don't know if there's enough there from Reed Shepard in terms of like ability to stay in front of guys and not lean on being handsy and jumping passing lanes and gambling. You ever heard of this before with the Raptors? Uh, Gary Trent Jr. ring any bells, for example? Like that's a, that to me feels like the the sort of defensive ceiling for Reed Shepard in the NBA is Gary Trent Jr. Where on the ball, maybe not so great, just kind of gets pushed around a little bit because he's so small. The arms aren't huge. You know, he blocked like a weird number of threes <laughs> in college. I'm not sure that holds up when you get to the NBA. Um, more ground to cover, you know, what deep, deeper three point line, bigger athletes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, that feels tricky to me. And, you know, I, I think he's got like good timing and defensive instincts and stuff for those gambles. But, you know, I, I just think gamble heavy defenders, they kind of give back a lot of what they give you in, in terms of steals and stuff. And so, um, and, and like, I just, you know, on a Nick Nurse team, great. Like a perfect player to slot in there. And look, if they're trying to replace Gary Trent Jr., if he's going to walk for nothing, like Reed Shepard kind of could be a Gary Trent Jr. stand-in where maybe you don't love him as a like a long-term starter, but as a long-term really nice bench piece who shoots threes and can offer you some defensive event creation. Sure, like there's something there. Um, but again, I think you should be drafting in this range of the draft looking for no doubt guys who are going to be key members of your team and it's hard to do that in this draft because there's a lot of unsure things and a lot of guys with a lot of holes but i think you got to be looking for higher upside um in terms of like long-term starter ability that i think reed shepherd really offers i could be like a caveat to all of the things i've said today i could be totally wrong about this stuff i don't know anything compared to like the super duper high scout people um but you know based on what i've seen based on the weaknesses i think the modern nba might be a tough place for reed shepherd to hang and you just you can't do much when you're six foot three with a six three wingspan it's really hard to overcome there's a reason the raptors go for guys with enormously long wingspans most of the time it's, it matters like having long arms turns out in basketball a valuable thing to have and so i i, I think like a gary Trent junior type defender is probably what he ends up shaking out as um a great stat from hoop intellect as well that is a little bit damning and a little bit ominous about what kind of player he could be Guys with usage under 20% in college, a free throw rate under 25%, and fewer than 70 rim attempts in the draft season, Josh Primo, A.J. Griffin, Gary Trent Jr., Isaiah Livers, Thomas Welsh, Reggie Bullock, Trey Murphy, who notably is 6'10", uh, <laughs> so big difference there, Darius Miller, like, these are the comps statistically to what Reed Shepard's offensive profile is. Not exactly inspiring a ton of confidence there. Um, you know, I, he's also, he just has a hard time creating. And, and like against college athletes, like the three-point shooting is lovely, but doing stuff getting downhill, doing stuff in the ball in his hands, like if he fancies himself a point guard, 
there's a lot of improvement to be done as a creator, as a guy who can break down a defense, overpower guys, use the shoulder to drop it into guys and get to your position. And it doesn't seem like he really has that right now. And it's not working against college athletes, against NBA athletes. Like, I don't know. It seems kind of dicey. Defensively, you know, the, the the physicality gives him issues too, right? He gives up a lot of blow buys. He gives up, uh, you know, he doesn't have the lateral quicks you want. That plays into the offense where he's not able to shake his defender quite as easily. And so, you know, I just think the package there, the three-point shooting, fascinating, the, the steals and the event creation and the sort of motor, really exciting. But a lot of the other stuff feels like it might be a little out of place in the NBA as it skews bigger and bigger and bigger every single year. And so for me, of the three guys we've talked about today, Shepard's the guy I, I think I'd least like on the Raptors. Like, I, I don't think he has the offensive upside nearly that Dillingham has. And I think you could talk me into the Dillingham upside. But much like Dillingham, I think I'd be pretty disappointed if the Raptors use their top six pick if they keep it on Reed Shepard in lieu of one of the guard or one of the wings or, um, you know, or Topic if he's there. Like, I, I think I would just rather them go bigger. And, you know, this team needs size. Like, they got so small after their trades this year. They lack length and defensive versatility. And I don't think Reed Shepard really offers that. I think both him and Dillingham probably end up being guys who like can't guard up in position and you're always compensating for them. And when you have Emmanuel quickly already, who's six foot three and is like kind of a slight guy who, you know, I think he's going to be a fine defender, maybe not a shutdown guy, but a fine one. Um, but like RJ Barrett struggled if Gary Trent Jr.'s back, he's not a very good defender. Grady Dick, you know, for all he offers is not a great individual defender yet. And so I, I think there's just like a need to prioritize defense here. And I don't know if Reed Shepard and the steel numbers really match what he's actually going to provide on an NBA floor defensively. And so I think it's a pass for me on Reed Shepard. Again, the Spurs, perfect. Put him on that team. Eh, Anyone can fit with Wemby. Pick anybody he fits there. It's kind of disgusting. Anyway, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for hanging out and listen to me, you know, yammer on about guards and stuff and make dumb puns about topical ointments and whatnot. Uh, thanks for hanging out. We'll be back again on tomorrow's show where we will talk about the uh, the other wings who might be there at six for the Raptors, Dalton Connect, Cody Williams, Jacoby Walter. Excited about that one. And then we'll have another episode either later Friday or on Saturday that drops. I'll be recording both tomorrow. We'll see time-wise when we put them out. But we'll have another episode this week talking about Jameer Watkins, Johnny Furphy, and Jalen Tyson. I, I, that might be the one I'm most excited for. Um, those wings in the lower part of the draft, man, in the 19 to 30 range, Hell yeah. Give me all of them. They're all super fun and interesting. And frankly, I think should be getting more love in the top six, but that's just me. Uh, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for hanging out and uh, for supporting the show. Hope this draft stuff has been fun. If there's a guy you want me to talk about, please let me know in the comments or on the discord. And I will certainly add them to my list of dudes to cover. Um, but yeah, full on draft season right now. It's weird, but it seems like the most prudent thing to do is the Raptors have a very big draft ahead. We'll continue that on show on the show tomorrow. In the meantime, follow, subscribe, rate, review, tell a friend, etc. Etc. Et Go to YouTube, subscribe to the channel, and we will talk to you again on Friday. Another episode of Locked On Raptors. Thanks for hanging. Bye bye.